Community outreach is the lifeline of research that seeks to inform and transform. As scholars, our role extends beyond academic rigor to make our work accessible and engaging. Professor Lindsay Kemp and I embraced this mission with immense pleasure and a sense of purpose. We had the honor of presenting our collaborative venture, the culmination of our research on women's leadership in the MENA region. Our project, Journal Beyond the Conventional, leading us to produce a podcast series celebrating women achievers, a policy paper aimed at influencing decision makers, a comprehensive research paper ready for journal publication, and not to forget the in-depth studio interviews we conducted with the help of our students at AURAC. And finally, the creation of an interactive virtual center. All these elements are bound by a continuous thread, the ever-growing expert women list, a testament to our commitment to community engagement and knowledge sharing. I invite you to witness this interactive dialogue that unfolded at the Majlis organized by the Al Qasmi Foundation late last year. What follows are some of the key moments from our presentation. A glimpse into the heart of our research and its resonance within the community. So I really, really want to thank the Al Qasimi Foundation. Tiffany is a wonderful role model of what the foundation is like. And thank you very much for all the work as well, you, John, that you do on training and development, which is a very important facet of any business. I'm particularly appreciative of the Al Qasimi Foundation, to be honest, because I've only been in Russell Khan, I've been in the UAE for years, probably a few more years than some of you have been born. But in Russell Keimer itself, I only came here about three years ago, and the call for the grant came through. And I didn't really know anybody, but you know, a couple of my colleagues said, um, what about doing, you know, getting involved in this grant? So I'm from a long background in academia. I apply for the grant, graciously get awarded with my colleague, Dr. Sabah Haag, Dr. Mohammed from management, and they wanted to partner university, so American University of Sharjah. And from then on, it became a much bigger project than we initially considered. And you'll see um, in a few minutes the outcome of this work, things like podcasts and video casts. What I'd just like to do now is to take you in to the centre. We went from a very flat, sort of like just website, to using the monies, some of the monies from the Al Qasimi Foundation to build a 3D virtual world that you can wander around and to hear the stories of women's achievements, mainly in the Northern Emirates, uh, particularly we're focused on Ras al Khaimah, and see the videos that have been made. Now, Dr. Saba mentioned earlier about this thing about a multidisciplinary team. When you're an academic, I'm from a business background years ago, but I've been mainly an academic. And then you start to work with people like Dr. Saba from Mass Communications, our colleague Narita Ahmed, who's from Management Information Systems, and then also a management expert, and Linda McLaughlin originally from sort of careers and um, coaching background. You then get together with people who it's the great thing about teamwork because different people's experiences and different people's ex perspectives made it make these things bigger than they would ever have been. So to give you an example, um, I say to our um, 
one of the people, members of the team about I've got Michelle Jamiras, who we hired as a consultant to do some multimedia work. And I said, I've got this image of, you know, these 3D conferences you can do and that we should be able to not just have this flat website, but the monies we've got, what can we do about being able to have a 3D site? And then Dr. Saber, because he's mass comms and he knows about this stuff, said, yeah, we can do that, and worked with my colleagues to build a 3D website and to produce things like the podcasts and the video casts. So it's an excellent example, I think, of using research monies that we earned in order to create something that we never dreamed was possible and then to be able to get it out there as part of our social impact to talk about it with you people and to let you know there are resources out here that you can use. On the life history narratives that I'm doing, it's I think it's wonderful because I just listen to these women as they tell their stories. And all I say is, I'm going to take you back from how you got to where you got, how you got here. From where you started, how did you get here? In this place and in this space and in this time. And I go, okay, so where were you born? Tell me a little bit about your childhood. They're very open questions. The art and science, I suppose, in life history narratives is very much just asking those open questions. And believe me, as you probably know, we ladies like to talk. And many of the women that I have spoken to have said to me afterwards, oh, bless Lindsay, I haven't had a ch chance to talk like that about my life ever, and it was wonderful. So they talk, and I probe because I'm not looking for any. So are you yeah, after me? Good. Okay. <laughs> I'm not looking for any particular answers. All I'm doing is going deeper and deeper into their stories because it's not in the academic work that I do and we do, it's not the particular women, it's the women as you get the themes and the patterns that are coming out about their lives. And, for instance, working with Dr. Saba on this turning point, that's one of the themes that we found. I wanted to add, uh, actually, because when, we, when you call for an interview, like usually, uh, the expectations are that we send them a set of questions. Um, and that is usually because I'm from broadcast and whenever we do interview with anybody, uh, it's always like, what are you going to ask me? Uh, and the reason why, it is also, also for a good reason because you want to come more prepared, right? I mean, if you are coming as an expert, if you're coming as, from a particular point of view, you would like to know what you're going to talk about. So I can like re-look re into like, you know, okay, what, what kind of structure am I going to use for talking? But in this kind of an interview, uh, it's not like it's not a structured way, and in particularly, and she, she's right. Most most of the interviews after the end, they're like, "Wow, I haven't thought about it for a while." Because we don't. I mean, there are times when you might really open up to a friend and you could talk about way back and how you kind of reached a point from one point to another, but we don't think about ourselves that much and the journey that we took ourselves. And I think that is something which is also insightful, not only for us, the audience, but also for the guests themselves. And that's, I think, is one, one thing we realized uh, with lots of guests, actually. Uh, with, with lots of guests, it was a great healing experience almost, like talking about how they have faced some of the tough challenges they had and kind of reached where they are basically today. So I think that was something which I wanted to ask. Yeah, thank you for bringing that in because I think we want to emphasize that with this latest paper that we've done, which you can read on the al -Kasimi, well, you can read the blog about the actual project. The journal article is awaiting publication because the turning points one was very interesting. And remember I said, you know, we're trying to add theory to in the academic work that we're doing. 
Because what was being acknowledged by these women as we looked back was there were turning points in their lives, but they're, they're not the ones that you know you sort of expect. They were things that came up, and these women might have grabbed an opportunity, or they might have made an opportunity, or they met somebody who suggested something. And honest to goodness, a lot of these women, and maybe you felt done it yourself, just changed their career, changed their position, went into, uh, you know, deciding to become an entrepreneur. Now, in the literature of careers, which is mainly um, a traditional way of, let's face it, men have usually been the one previously in careers. So most of the literature on careers is that sort of linear. As you go on, you're earning more money, you're getting higher, you know, getting promotions. And so it's seen as like that. We're adding theory in of the women in the workplace maybe getting there, but in some ways they're going like that. And in many cases, this idea of this career trajectory is being ignored, thrown away, not seen as practical by women, and that's absolutely fine. But in the academic way of we're doing things, we've got to add this theory in in order for people to acknowledge it, to take it further in the future. Um, so, I've got a whole database of women that I've interviewed over the years. We've then formed some podcasts. We've also had a blog on the um, Al Qasimi Foundation and also policy as well. It's one another thing section that I want to ask. So we're adding to theory, we're adding to practice, we're also adding to policy and Al Qasimi Foundation as part of the grant enables us to write a policy paper that then influences people who are making policy in the governmental sense and also within corporations. Now Expertise, and here's something for you to add yourself into, ladies. We realized that what we were seeing on conference platforms and hearing on radio broadcasts and seeing was a lot of expertise from men. And what we also recognized was that expertise is expertise and should not be gendered. But of course what you've got is a situation where there's mainly men who are organizing conferences or mainly men who are at the top of the tree or mainly men who are doing radio broadcasts and TV shows. Who are they going to ask for their expertise, their own network, which is the expertise from males? So we realized that what needed to happen was to expand expertise. And if you're ignoring half of the workforce, i.e. the female part, <laughs> then you're losing a lot of your expertise. And that is bad for business because you're missing out on half of what could be added into the expertise of your corporation or businesses. So expert in Expertise in, output out. So how do we solve this problem? So we created, and please add yourself into this, and the gentlemen in the audience, you can speak to your women that you know with expertise to add themselves to this database. It's really, really simple. You sign into the expert list. The expert list is a database. You put in your information. You put in your expertise, whatever that is, whether it's nuclear science, coaching, mentoring, teaching, you get as specific as you want, all right? So that's the women signing up to the expert list. And men can encourage women to sign into the expert list. 
The other side of the database is if you're looking for expertise, you can search that database by putting in keywords to search for whatever expertise it is. And you get a person with that expertise, it just happens to be a woman, but it's with that expertise. Now, we showcased this database quite some time ago to some companies. One of the things was suggested to us was, well, board membership, there's very few women on, board, on boards of companies, especially out here, which is another paper that I've had published long ago about lack of, what can we do about women getting on boards. He said, so why don't you have a, a space for board readiness or board experience? So that when people are searching for board members, they can go to the database and find them. They just happen to be women. So with input from businesses, we've built this database. Another one was human resource managers saying to us, well, hang on a minute, it's not just about the women on conference platforms and the not hearing, the, you know, getting them on um, radio and TV. What about the whole thing about searching for human resources? searching for talent, that actually human resource managers can use this database to find talent that they need for their companies. I was talking about the, the output and the kind of engagement that we managed to have because of all these different tools that we're using. Um, as a researcher, I mean, for the longest time, and, you know, and we didn't talk about it, but, uh, you know, because of the variety of team members that we had, you know, um, we had this opportunity to really engage. What happens usually is when a researcher does a research, um, the good question to ask it, what next? Like you are working on a particular area and you have done some research and you found some information and then you pass it on to your academic, uh, academic community, but what next? Do you continue with that level of engagement with that uh, area? In this case, it is a continuation. Like, for example, we would not let the podcast go away. We would continue working on the podcast. Whatever paper we are doing, for example, are we getting the... Like, for example, this, this, this module is a great example. I mean, whatever we found, whatever we understood from the research is what we are now giving back to the community. And I think that's a very, very important question that every researcher, I feel, should ask themselves. And not to shy away, obviously, from using new tools, because you have to go beyond a policy paper, you have to go beyond a paper published in a journal. And I think um, uh, a technology does maybe look like a challenge for you, to be, to be honest, but I think if it is looking at the, the new platform that we have, YouTube, where are forced to actually include a new section of podcast. So you can, actually, you can actually create a video and make it into a podcast on YouTube immediately. Uh, so there is no entry barrier, it's free of cost. Uh, you can just create content, you can just upload it. So I think you have, uh, you have such tools and I think that's a very important element of what we call as a research dissemination. What do we do once we find out what we found out in the research? And how do we find ways to connect and reconnect and continue the connection with the stakeholders, for example, in this in this paper uh, or in this project, it is the women that we interviewed uh, over, over the last one year and we engaged with. So I think that's a very important takeaway that I, I am I am I took from this paper is that a paper is just not a paper; it's a project is not not a project. And the end goal is to continue having having those conversations. And I think we will definitely talk about the next season of the podcast that will be towards the end. But opening up for for any questions that you might have.